Hi, my name is Sammy Riccio, and I am the Donor Engagement Coordinator for Hawkwatch International, and I want to welcome you to our event today, The Impact of Raptors on Game Bird Populations. So the presentation today should be about an hour, and we are going to start things off with Tori Thorpe, who is our field biologist, um, currently pursuing her master's at Utah State. And then we are going to hear from Dr. Fidel Atuo, our um, uh, HWI board member and also assistant professor at the Southeast Missouri State University. We are going to save the last five to 10 minutes for question and answer. So if you have any questions throughout the event, please put them in the chat. Um, I wanna say that we are able to offer this programming for free thanks to ZAP funding for those of you who are local to Salt Lake County and with additional support from donors like you. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Tori. Hi everybody. I'm gonna get my screen shared here with you. All right. So as Sammy mentioned, I'm Tori Thorpe. I'm a field biologist at Hawkwatch International and a grad student at Utah State University. And today I'm going to be talking to you about golden eagle predation of greater sage grouse. My partners on this project are the vernal offices of the Bureau of Land Management, the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, the U.S. Forest Service, and Utah State University. So first I'm gonna give you some background information. Um, we're gonna talk about the conservation status of golden eagles and sage grouse, and my study components for this project, and then conclude with the next steps of my project. So my study area is the Diamond Mountain Plateau located in Uinta County, Utah. For those of you not familiar with Utah geography, it's in the northeastern part of the state, close to the Colorado and Wyoming borders. Here is a zoomed in map and you can see Diamond Mountain Plateau in the center there. And this area has federal, state and private land. And this black line um, is represents a 10 mile radius of the Lex on Diamond Mountain Plateau. And in that area, I'm searching for golden eagle nests because there's not a lot of great nesting habitat on the plateau itself. So the two species of my project that I'm focused on are the greater sage grouse and the golden eagle. And this is a picture of a male sage grouse here on the left, and he is strutting along the side of the road near one of the leks. Greater sage grouse are the largest North American grouse species and one of only two sage grouse species in the world. The other is the Gunnison sage grouse. The golden eagle is one of two species of eagles we have in North America, the other being the bald eagle. And they're found throughout the Western um, US and Canada and inhabit a variety of different biomes. In the sagebrush ecosystem, they can be found as year round residents. Golden eagles are one of the natural predators of greater sage grouse and other predators of adults include coyotes, great horned owls, red foxes, northern goshawks, bobcats, red-tailed hawks, ferruginous hawks, Swainson's hawks, and Cooper's hawks. And although many species will eat sage grouse, no one species specializes on predating them. Although golden eagles do predate sage grouse, lagomorphs generally constitute the largest proportion of prey in golden eagle diets. And if you're not familiar, lagomorphs include rabbits, hares, and pikas. And the abundance of lagomorphs is cited as one of the critical factors affecting golden eagle reproductive success. Although predation of sage grouse is likely to play a significant role in the decline of sage grouse, few observational studies 
have focused specifically on golden eagle predation of sage grouse and or sought to quantify sage grouse response to golden eagles during the lek period. So at this point, you've heard me say lek a bunch of times. And if you're not familiar, a lek is a gathering for the purpose of courtship displays and mating. And lekking is the behavior of displaying and strutting. Counting annual male attendance has served as the primary means for monitoring sage grouse populations for more than 80 years. And generally these lek areas are flat open areas on the prairie, um, as you can see here in this photo. And the lek period occurs from March through the middle of May. And the birds will start gathering um, at first light and they'll continue their displays a few hours after sunrise. This is when males are most vulnerable to predation. Um, and that's because they're coming out of the cover of the sagebrush and displaying. And that's also why they're easy for land managers to count them. Quantifying how sage grouse react to various predators at the lek and the duration of those responses will provide more information on the relationships between sage grouse and their predators during the lek period. Now I want to talk a little bit about the conservation status of both sage grouse and golden eagles. Greater sage grouse are considered a Utah species of greatest conservation need. And the federal status is a little bit more complex, as you may have heard in the news the last decade or so. They were first petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act in 1999 and have since been petitioned an additional seven times. In 2010, they received candidate species status, but were ruled as not a priority over other candidate species. In 2015, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that greater sage grouse do not warrant protection under the Endangered Species Act. The most recent update is in 2021, the BLM announced that they're reviewing greater sage grouse management plans on BLM managed public lands. And this is really important because the BLM manages the largest proportion of sagebrush, ha sagebrush habitat in the United States. A 2016 population estimate for US and Canada is around 432,000 individuals. The golden eagle is also considered a Utah species of greatest conservation need, as well as a regional priority species of the Western US. A population estimate from the same source estimates there to be about 57,000 individuals in the US and Canada. And as you can see, that's, there are a lot fewer golden eagles than sage grouse. This is a pre-European, um, this map shows both the pre-European sage grouse distribution compared to the current sage grouse distribution. So you can see the light green represents pre-settlement and the dark green is the current estimates. So you can see that currently they're occupying a lot um, less area than they were prior to European settlement. And they've been ex extirpated on the periphery of their range in states including Arizona, Nebraska, and parts of British Columbia. As I mentioned before, counting male sage grouse at Lex is one of the primary means for tracking populations long-term. And this is a figure from the 2021 Utah Greater Sage Grouse Let Count Report. And you can see here over the last 20 years, we've had ups and downs in the population estimates, but specifically the last three years, we've seen a lot fewer males counted at the Lex. And this is really interesting compared to the number of leks visited each year. So despite more and more leks being visited by wildlife managers each year, we're seeing fewer males overall. 
This is another figure from the same report, and this one gives us a nice trend line of the last 20 years showing a general decline in greater sage grouse let counts throughout the state of Utah. This is the same figure except for the Uinta County sage grouse management areas, which is the county where my study is located. And one thing that's really interesting is you see the same ups and downs in the let count trends, but there's actually a slight increase over time in male attendance at the LEX. Um, as I mentioned before, jackrabbits um, and other rabbits are the primary prey source of golden eagles. And rabbits also have a similar cycling pattern to sage grouse. You can see that in 2015 and 2016, they experienced a similar height of population. And the last few years, we've been seeing an overall decrease in the rabbit counts throughout the state of Utah. Here I have those two figures side by side where you can see that in 2015, 2016, both rabbits and sage grouse experienced peaks. And then the last few years, um, that overall decline and Several studies have found that rabbit and sage grouse cycles are closely correlated. And that's really important because a high rabbit abundance sage grouse. And alternatively, golden eagles may prey upon sage grouse more frequently following rabbit population declines. Due to the complexity of ecological relationships between cyclical species that share a predator, examining the rabbit populations on Diamond Mountain may yield some interesting information about the local relationship between rabbits and sage grouse. Now maybe you're thinking, why are sage grouse declining? Um, and as I previously mentioned, it is unlikely that golden eagles are a significant contributor to the decline in sage grouse. And it's really important to think about all the changes in the landscape that the sagebrush ecosystem has seen since the arrival of European settlers. And these changes include conversion of rangeland to croplands, alterations in the fire regime where we're seeing some areas burn much more frequently and other areas not being burned at all, grazing, encroachment of trees, specifically pinyon pine and juniper, proliferation of non-native plant species, especially cheatgrass, which you can see in the middle right photo, and the introduction of anthropogenic structures. So historically, the sagebrush landscape was characterized by vast open expanses of sagebrush with very few trees or tall structures. Today, the introduction of anthropogenic structures such as telephone poles, fences, power lines, transmission towers, provide structures for raptors and corvids to utilize as perches and nesting structures. Previous research has investigated the impact of tall structures and the increased risk of predation of sage grouse, but they often do not assess the proportion of sage grouse in predator diets relative to other prey species. And there are still knowledge gaps on the influence of tall structures on the direct raptor predation of sage grouse and other possible negative effects on sage grouse behavior at Lex. This photo is from one of the Lex on Diamond Mountain in my study area. You can actually see on the ice, um, there's a sage grouse. And this lek is split by a road and power lines and two different fence lines, one running parallel to the road and one running perpendicular. Although understanding raptor predation is 
really important to understand their effects on sage grouse, it's really important for us to keep things in perspective. Predators, including raptors, have often been viewed negatively because of their ability to take livestock and compete with hunters for wild game. In Europe, raptors have been persecuted for centuries because they are viewed as competition to game bird hunting. I found these posters from the Pennsylvania Game Commission to help hunters separate good hawks like the peregrine falcon on the left from bad hawks like the goshawk on the right. And until 1951, the Pennsylvania Game Commission even had a bounty for $5 on goshawks. Today, golden eagles in the U.S. are protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918 and the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act of 1942. But despite these protect protections, research published in 2022 found that illegal shootings account for nearly 700 golden eagle deaths each year. And due to their protection status and conservation status, it is an unreasonable management solution to consider removing raptors for the benefits of sage grouse. Now that I've given you some background info, I want to talk about how I'm studying golden eagle predation of sage grouse on Diamond Mountain Plateau. One of the main components of my project is conducting observational surveys at LEX and this includes counting male lek attendants as well as female lek attendants, and also identifying all predators close to the lek, how far away they are from the lek, and how much time they're spending near the lek. And we're also looking at predator behavior, whether they're flying through, perching on power poles, or on natural features. And I'm hoping to use this data to quantify golden eagle use of power poles specifically during the lek season and quantify sage grouse response to the presence of golden eagles. Then I plan to compare golden eagle predation of sage grouse at leks near power poles to leks with no power poles to help understand the impact of anthropogenic structures. I'm also deploying transmitters on golden eagles in the study area. And this is to help answer the question of whether or not the golden eagles on Diamond Mountain Plateau are year round residents or migratory eagles. The lek period coincides with the timing of spring raptor migration. So I'm interested in whether or not eagles spending time near the leks are passing through and opportunistically hunting sage grouse or whether they're year-round residents that are regularly visiting this area because they know that it's a good source of prey. I'm also collecting golden eagle feather mute and pellet samples. Um, if you're not familiar, a mute is the basically feces and urine combined. Um, and this is to help me answer the question of the prevalence of sage grouse in golden eagle diets. So I can do that by doing DNA metabarcoding of the pellet and mute samples. And this will look for the DNA of various prey species. And from that, I can get an idea of how many samples contained sage grouse DNA in them. And for feathers, I can do stable isotope analysis to identify the origin of the feather, which will also help answer whether or not the golden eagles in the area are year-round residents or migratory eagles. And this photo here is a picture of a fresh pellet that I found underneath a power pole. And it's kind of hard to see, but there's a, a sage grouse foot in there. You can see the skin of the foot and then poking out of the top are the sage grouse nails. I'm also doing rabbit driving surveys. So these are conducted on the way to the lek sites each morning. And I'm hoping to quantify the prevalence of golden eagle primary prey relative to long-term statewide trends and possible influence on sage grouse predation. Um, 
And this will help me get a baseline understanding of prey abundance on Diamond Mountain as a whole. I'm also deploying nest cameras, and this is to study the various types of prey delivered to the nests. And I can use this camera data to classify frequency and types of prey delivered. And I'm hoping to compare what I see on the cameras to what I find for prey species in the DNA analysis of the pellets and the mutes. And unfortunately, this year we only had one in use golden eagle nest that remained in use through the nesting period in the study area um, that was also accessible to repel into. And this photo is from that nest and you can see that the nestling has a marmot that one of its parents delivered to the nest. And you can also see the transmitter on the back of the eagle and its color band that helps recite um, the individual. The last component of my study is investigating sage grouse mortalities. So some of the sage grouse in the study area have transmitters and when the transmitter um, is showing a mortality signal, we can find the transmitter and hopefully find out why the sage grouse died. And um, this is a photo from an in-use great horned owl nest that my technician found, and the sage grouse transmitter is in that nest. So the next steps going forward are submitting all my samples for analysis, preparing my thesis proposal for grad school, analyzing my pilot season data, and preparing for the next field season. And this photo is from early in the field season when a lot of the roads to the Lex were still covered in snow. And I'm trying to dig out my car um, because we got it stuck in the snow. Now I'll turn it back over to Sammy and we'll answer questions from the chat at the end of Fidel's presentation. But if you don't get your question answered, feel free to email me at tthorpe at hawkwatch.org. Thanks. Thank you, Tori. That was great. I'm excited to see what we find out throughout your master's. So Tori, I have a question from you in the, for you in the chat. And they ask, um, if you've observed more resident eagles predating on the sage grouse, or if you've seen more younger birds doing it in your first season of field work. In the first season, we actually never observed a successful predation from eagles on the grouse. Um, it did seem that younger eagles attempted more. Um, but I'm hoping to find a lot more information in the next two years of field work on whether or not most of the eagles hanging around are migratory eagles or year round residents and the age as well. Hello? Is it working now? Yes, we hear you. Oh, okay. Perfect Sorry. timing. <laughs> Still seeing my screen? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. seeing it yet. There we go. You're ready to go. Oh, okay. Okay, guys. Uh, sorry about all the technical difficulties. My name is Fidel Atu, and uh, I'll be sharing with you here the work I did several years back. So this is not as uh, recent as Doris' work. So mine is a little bit uh, older. So uh, it will be, I don't think many things have changed since I completed this work, but uh, I've not been in touch to check it out. So I'm going to talk about how habitat complexity might affect predation risks for 
uh, grassland obligates, like uh, the sage grass that tourists show. So we know that historically, most of these areas within the central United States here were, were just grasslands. So they were huge open grasslands. And we've lost most, uh, much of that due to so many uh, anthropogenic disturbances. And we'll talk about them here in a minute. But if you were to look at grasslands, mostly like the ones we, we have in Western Oklahoma, they look like that. They are just open plains, large areas of grasslands that uh, are preferred by grassland obligates, mostly, uh, I would say, birds that I'm going to focus on today. So the things that have really uh, affected these grasslands are things like massive agriculture that converts grassland ecosystems to uh, farms. Or here we see woody encroachment. So it could be just the encroachment of woody vegetation. Remember, like Tori said, most of these areas evolved uh, not to have structures. So the presence of these structures really transform grassland into something else or maybe just uh, oil explorations like the ones we have here. Grassland ecosystems are traditionally maintained by uh, disturbance regimes like fire and grazing. And we've seen a drastic reduction in this uh, stuff as well. So the absence of fire and grazing might affect the way grassland functions and the ecosystem services that they provide. So for grassland birds like uh, quail, which is a little bit smaller than sage grass, uh, sage grass here, which again, what we have in Oklahoma, they require large areas of grassland to reproduce even though they require some variability within these grassland ecosystems, it is important to them that grasslands uh, are maintained at large patches such that they can forage, uh, have their reproductive activities, lay their nests and raise their young. Something that we've noticed in the past several years is that populations of most of these grassland obligates have been declining and among them quail as well. So we've seen a steady but steep decline in the populations of uh, bob white quail uh, in the last several decades. So several reasons can be uh, attributed to this decline, like I've showed from the beginning, the loss of grassland ecosystem to woody encroachment, uh, lack of fire in the uh, in grassland ecosystems, or lack of uh, grazing. All of these contribute to loss in grassland ecosystems, and they affect well. But something that we've not really pay uh, much attention to, or in other on the, other, on the other hand, have been exaggerated is the impact that predators can have on uh, birds like quail. So in this study, I tried to explore how predators can directly or indirectly impact quail populations. Again, we go back to Tori's presentation about uh, raptors population. It's true, over the years, we've seen huge decline in raptor populations prior to the, the protection that raptors receive. So when we stop all the bounties on raptors and again, coupled with uh, the ban on DDT, we've seen steady population growth for most 
raptors. So looking at raptors like Cooper's hawk, sharp-shin hawks, or red-tailed hawks, they've all uh, witnessed a steady population growth. So for most people, it is so easy to incriminate raptors as a key uh, driver of population declines in honorable prey species like Bob White Quail. So the question I choose to ask in this uh, research I, I'm sharing with you is how does raptor pre, uh, predation really impact quail in the face of changes in grassland uh, habitat structure? So I we we'll call this heterogeneity at this point, but basically it is just habitat complexity uh, mediating the impact that predators might have on prey species. Indeed, when we manage habitats for uh, biodiversity, we often do this to increase heterogeneity. So heterogeneity is a great thing to do in all habitat management. But again, depending on the scale of heterogeneity, it might be a great um, it, it might be a great support for habitat selection, or might just create risky sites for some vulnerable species. And several studies have documented this. So I'll show this a little bit using our concept of niche partitioning in. Uh, ecology. So let's say we have three areas. We have these areas that are colored differently in this part of the presentation, or the slide rather. So let's say species A prefer this area that is in gray, species B prefer that area in orange, and species C prefer that area in blue. And we have sufficient large patches of each of these areas, then there will be little uh, need for these species to come uh, in contact and in conflict. But if we change this uh, patch structure such that we bring little patches of each of these mixed together, then we put all of these species in close competitive proximity. And what that happened is that as many species try to compete for limited resources, there had to be intense pressure on some vulnerable prey species that have not evolved adaptations to deal with uh, these multiple predators. So here I'm asking simple questions like, does vegetation complexity really increase the direct impact that predators might have on prey species like quail. And if this habitat complexity also uh, creates some form of fear, which will be indirect impact of predation on prey such that it affects their fitness. So this work I did at two wildlife management areas in Western Oklahoma, so Pack Saddle and Beaver River Wildlife Management Areas. Both areas are managed by the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, uh, mostly to increase populations of quail and uh, maybe other uh, fauna species, but the main focus on each of these wildlife management areas is to increase quail populations. Okay, so if you look at these images, you will see uh, a vegetation map of Beaver River and that of Pack Saddle. Something that should jump at you right away is that Pack Saddle appears to have this little complex uh, colors that shows a landscape with tiny patches of different vegetation while Beaver River appears to have these large uh, areas of unique vegetation uh, types. 
in so if you were to visit this landscape this is what you will see so beaver river huge area with less uh complexity packs are the another huge area but this time around with a lot of that woody vegetation sometimes crossed out of them or scattered in upland uh areas of the management, the wildlife management area. Several predators or several raptors would take uh, quail. But in this presentation, I'm just going to focus on two species, like the red-tailed hawk and the northern harriers. So first, what I did was to go out and estimate the population or the abundance of these predators on the landscape and see if they have any impact on quail. So I drove around transit lines that I established in this area and count, uh, counted all the raptors that I saw with focus on uh, red tailed hawks and northern harriers. I didn't have all the resources that Tori has right now, so I couldn't uh, get all the fancy equipment that uh, we needed for this work. So I couldn't trap raptors and put transmitters on them. So what I did instead was to drive this transit line and wherever I sighted a, a raptor, I will mark the GPS coordinates representing the location of that raptor. So as you will expect, those GPS locations, because they were taken by me from the comfort of my truck, will not represent the actual location of the bird as of the time it was sighted. Rather, they will represent my location at the time I sighted the bird. So I needed to figure a way of moving this point to the actual location where the birds were sighted. So I did that using some of these uh, cool GIS tools that are available to anyone that is able to use GIS. So with these tools, I was able to move points that I collected along the transit line, like demonstrated here, to exact locations where birds were found. So now the points represent birds' locations and not my location. And once I was able to do that, I then put uh, buffers around each point at different special scales to estimate vegetation cover. Luckily, we were able to obtain this 10 meter resolution neat image of the land cover uh, map of that of these two areas. So once we had these maps, we could uh, put buffers around locations that represented uh, bird use and extract vegetation that uh, occur within those buffers. So for most vegetation cover, I was able to reclassify those into about eight different cover types. Sometimes organisms could select an area not just based on what the area holds, but based on its proximity to some other resources or its proximity away from uh, dangerous resources. So to help me do that, we obtained this really fine scale two meter resolution uh, uh, image, and then using that, identify areas that were open water access road, oil pass, and calculated uh, or develop uh, something that we will call files of proximity. So I looked at prox uh, develop proximity uh, rasters from these images. OK, so that was a quick review of how I collected Raptor data. The next thing was to find out where uh, quail were dying and areas that 
uh, where we are utilizing. So to do that, uh, we got other graduate students that trapped quail, put transmitters on them, and we're tracking them. So we collaborated with them to find out locations where uh, mortality, where mortality were occurring. So they gave us locations of all areas that they lost quail. And those areas, we also uh, worked with them to identify the, the culprit, I would say, that was responsible for that mortality, say, uh, what was, if a bird died, who determine if it was due to raptor predation, mammalian predation, or simply an unknown predation event. So we collected all of uh, those data and we were able to co uh, correlate them with raptor abundance and habitat use. So those uh, some results from that study. Well, the first thing we were interested in was to look at raptor populations. And to do that, we calculate we calculate the raptor uh, densities across these two ecosystems or these landscapes. So again, remember I showed you those images of Beaver River, which is a more open area, traditional grassland ecosystem with less woody encroachment and then uh, pike saddle with that complexity. What we saw was that in terms of population density, we had way more uh, densities of raptors, specifically red tail hawks and uh, northern harriers at Beaver River compared to pike saddle. So, that's probably because uh, Beaver River lies in a migration flyway where most uh, raptors are overwintering during the winter and um, living back at the end of the wintering season. So we had generally more, abund uh, more abundance of these raptors at Beaver River. And of course, because we are down south, we expect that in the winter, that abundance will be way higher compared to the spring and summer. So that, of course, will correlate with uh, the non-breeding season of quail, which is also the non-breeding season of these raptors. However, when we looked at mortality rates in these two, wildlife management areas, we see a huge uh, significant difference between Pack Saddle and Beaver River. Although we had a lot of raptors at Beaver River, mortality was way higher at Pack Saddle than uh, Beaver River, which is less complex. So we decided to zoom in a little bit to look at the sort of areas that raptors were selecting first and see if those areas correlated with areas that we were seeing mortality uh, risks for quail. So we did a simple uh, analysis, something they will call resource selection function, but what that simply means is uh, a regression analysis. So it's uh, a logistic regression analysis with binary outcomes. So here we'll present the results of those analyses as they relate to use. Now, the dotted line in the middle of this graph will represent the mean of selection. So if we have any of these dots above that line, it means that that habitat is being preferred and selected for by these predators. And then if it's beneath that line, it means the habitat variable or the vegetation variable rather is uh, not selected, in fact, it's avoided. And of course, it's, it's, if it's within that line, then we're saying that that selection is not significant. So let's start with red tail hawk here. 
So what we see is that greater hawk prefer these upland shrub areas, uh, avoided his grass cover areas, and did not show any uh, selection for bay grounds. They avoided pasture areas. It looks like they selected more of uh, riparian forest areas, but that was not significant. And uh, upland woody vegetation too was selected for, but not significantly different from avoidance. And all of this result represents selection at back saddle. When we put areas to that uh, graph, that's what we see. So we see that in some areas, there is uh, overlap in selection between areas and red tail hawks. Now let's put risky areas as, as these areas where we were recording uh, significant mortalities of uh, bulk white quail. You will see. Again, where we have these points above the line means where we're dying significantly. And where we have them below, the line means where we're doing very well. And that's what you see. So if you were to uh, circle those out, we will see that all the areas where we have quail dying significantly are areas where uh, red tail hawk and northern area appear to overlap in their selection. However, if we move to Beaver River, which is less complex or less heterogeneous in this case, we see different patterns. And we see that areas where quail were dying were significantly low. In fact, it was just one area which is areas with that were mostly grasslands. And in that area, we could only attribute one predator to mortality, and that would be the northern area. And areas don't breed in backside or down south. In fact, they don't breed anywhere down south. So it means that this mortality risk from predation is only uh, apparent during the non breeding season of quail. So quail are not having a lot of pressure from predators. I don't know how much time we had, but all of this is trying to present this information in graphic, uh, graphical uh, way such that it can be utilized easily by wildlife managers for decision making. So if we don't have time, and I assume we, it's almost um, six o'clock here for me, I will just skip all of those uh, complex analyses. But overall, what I want us to take home is that at a place like Pack Saddle, we, uh, we try to classify risky areas within the landscape. And we saw that for the entire landscape, when it comes to predation, about 32% of the entire landscape is an area where both uh, tail hawk and northern area overlap greatly and might present a significant risk to quail. And we see that uh, high for red tail hawk, but not very much for areas. Again, remember I said areas. Uh, and non-resident birds, so they come in just during the uh, winter, and we have more of them at Beaver River. So at Beaver River, we can say that about 25 or 24% of the area is open to area predation risks. In conclusion, I will say, we try to look at how complex the habitat was at each of these sites that quail were dying. So for each spot where we had mortality of quail, we put 100 meters reduced buffers around those areas to characterize how complex those uh, 
vegetation walls around those areas. And we end up with this. We say that at the back side of whatever where we're dying as a result of uh, northern area predation or uh, red tail predation, all of those areas were way more complex in terms of vegetation structure compared to Beaver River. So I would say, did it appears that uh, raptor densities were high in these areas, especially during the winter, and those could somehow uh, impact on well uh, survivor. And then we're able to quantify that landscape of uh, uh, predation risks that managers could pick up and use to implement uh, management outcomes or management planning that could reduce predation risks. Like Tori says, people are often very happy to say, okay, maybe let's uh, reduce raptor population uh, because their impacts is uh, telling on quail. But that's not what we are saying in this study. What we are saying is that change in uh, the landscape structure from traditional structures to some encroachment like woody vegetation can change the way species interact on the landscape and might increase predation risks. So what we need to do is reduce uh, that complexity by somehow removing woody encroachment from grassland ecosystems. I think that's where I'll stop. And uh, if we have time for questions, I'll probably take some questions. All righty. So thank you, Fidel, for that presentation. Um, yeah, so we'll take a few questions. So um, if you have any, please pop them in the chat. For now, I have one question for Tori asking if you've ever witnessed a lek being flushed by an eagle attack. They personally have seen one on one occasion, but the golden eagle was unsuccessful. So I didn't personally witness that this spring, but my technician did witness that where golden eagle flew low over the lek and all the grouse flushed. And then the golden eagle actually perched on the ground near the lek, and the sage grouse never came back to the lek that day. Um, and that's one of the things I'm interested in: is if they flush, do they ever come back once the predator leaves, or do they not return at all until the next morning? All right, I have another question for Tori asking, what is the ratio female versus male GSG in your area? So based on the first season, that really depends on the day and the period of the lex season. Um, early on, we had mostly males coming and just a few females. And then probably around the end of March, early April, we had peak female attendance. And then once again, the females started to trail off. And as the season went on, fewer and fewer males came out to the lick. Great. Um, Fidel, I was wondering what is the work that you're focusing on these days since that was your PhD project? Oh, I can't hear you, Fidel, you're muted. <laughs> Oh yeah, so I'm currently doing a few other projects. So I'm interested in fires in savanna ecosystems. So I'm still working with grassland or ground dwelling birds, still galliforms. So I'm looking at how fires impact galliforms, uh, habitat selection and predation risks, but this time around in savanna ecosystems. So I have a graduate student working on that. Uh, I'm also interested in some social ecological stuff. So looking at how we can uh, encourage young people uh, to join this conservation career. So I'm looking at how uh, things like social media, uh, video games could impact on um, uh, how much time 
kids or youth spend outdoors because we want youth to spend more time out, outside for many reasons, for the health benefits that it provides, but also because it provides funding for conservation in the long term. State agencies rely on things like uh, uh, resources, monies that comes from game hunting and fishing to fund conservation research. And if we are not having people spending time outdoors or buying those licenses, paying those fees, we might just run short of monies for conservation in the future. So that's something else I'm interested in. I'm also still interested in how oil and gas structures are uh, impacting on habitat availability for uh, birds in still in Western Oklahoma. Great. Well, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. So I'm going to thank everybody for joining us today. Once again, a recording of this lecture will be posted on our YouTube channel. And thank you again to Fidel and Tori for putting on such a great talk for everybody today. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one. Thanks.